Hi, good morning. I'm very happy that so many people came. Uh, there is a lot of other great sessions happening at the same time and it's also early morning kind of uh, for people who were partying last night. It's very nice to see everyone. Um, this is gonna be a session about press freedom and innovation. I have great speakers at this session. Um, so I'm gonna introduce them now. So like on my right, uh, there is Natalia Antelava from Coda Story. And then there is Christian Lupsa, Dor. And then there is Hannah, no, Hannah is at the end, but this is Hannah Lubakova. <laughs> and Andras Peto uh, from Direct 36. Um, my name is Alicja Peszkowska and I'm from Outriders. Uh, we are an organization based in Poland. But we also have this project um, which I'm actually working on. It's called Outriders Network and what we do, we are a knowledge sharing platform for journalists and storytellers who struggle with some of the things we're gonna discuss today. So, so the first thing I wanna talk about is innovation. This is actually the main thing we want to talk about during this session. And I want to make clear that it's not gonna be innovation in terms of bots in your newsroom. We're gonna be talking about social innovation. So about new ways of addressing social needs where we work. And I wanted to ask my speakers who, three of them run great organizations. One of them is a freelance journalist. So how they address, how they deal with innovation in their work where they are. And they will probably also talk about examples of their great work. So maybe I would actually like Christian to start. Okay. What does social innovation mean to you? Good morning. Um, so I, I run a newsroom in Romania. We started 10 years ago. And uh, we started as a, just as a quarterly print, uh, long form nonfiction magazine. And now we grew an organization that also does that. So we are very much focused on long form nonfiction, which is a form that is not really present in our, in Europe in general, but especially in, uh, in Eastern Europe. So we do that. We also run live events, do live journalism. We do, podcasts, we run a digital publication covering education, so we've done a lot of innovation, let's say, and the, the way we think about innovation it's, is less in terms of product and more in terms of that basic definition of innovation being um, a process, uh, and a process of improving on things that already um, exist, and all the things that we came up with were not necessarily born out of uh, government pressures or, um, you know, prob or any kinds of things that um, other journalists really struggle with. And for all of you who've heard Ma uh, Maria Ressa talk yesterday, that's what it means to really fight with, a, with an authoritarian government. That was not the case in Romania. Our innovation mostly came from uh, the fact that the legacy traditional outlets that were around were just not doing the kind of work that we wanted to do. So when we started the magazine, we did it because all of us had worked for commercial magazines where our editors and publishers just didn't care about the, the readers. Uh, they actually had nicknames for them. Uh, that I'm not gonna repeat here. So, and they kept telling us we don't have money to spend to do better journalism. So we, <laughs> we thought, because we were naive, we thought how hard could it be? Um, so that's how we started really asking ourselves, how hard could it be to put out a magazine uh, where you care about the content, you also care about the form and you, you package it and then you care about the experience of the people that are gonna read it. So that's where that's where we that's where we started, and uh, we continued to I guess improve on that format. And in terms of process, everything we've done in the past ten years has been learning how to do it better, and how to add on top of it, and how to build new things. Uh, and I'll say one more thing, and then I'll let the others uh, jump in. Um, the good and the bad in Romania, and this might be true for some of uh, your own countries, is that the best and most interesting journalism comes from outside legacy and traditional media. And I say this is good because it means that there's a space to create new things, space to try new things, 
and that is the perfect uh, place where you can bring some of the new concepts that you've been hearing about here um, and try them out. The bad is that we are all still, I'm not going to use the word independent, uh, but I'm going to use the word niche. So we're all still small. So our reach for people, for small newsrooms is, is limited. Maybe it's 10,000 people, maybe it's 100,000 people if, you, if you're lucky. Maybe if it's a big thing that goes viral, it might be uh, 500,000 or a, a million people. That is still way under the reach of traditional media in that part of the world who have done none of the things you hear about in, in, uh, in Perugia. They've not even given it a shot, not in terms of form, not in terms of distribution, not in terms of business models. So they're still doing the same things they've been doing for um, 10, 15 years. Uh, and they still, have, uh, they still have the audiences that allow them to to keep at it. So I think that's, that's, that's the bad, that the good journalism doesn't reach as many people, or the innovative journalism doesn't reach as many people as it, uh, as it could to really have an impact. Thank you. Um, and I just wanted to, yeah, I just wanted to say again that like, uh, if innovation is addressing different people's needs, those can be the needs, it can be a need to be connected and yes, to kind of work on your own personal narrative or of a, on a narrative of a community. Um, but another need might be to actually get access to, get access to media that doesn't lie, which maybe, I don't know, Andres wants to talk to a little bit. How is it for you? Uh, thank, you for, thank you for coming and uh, thank you for having me on this uh, panel. And I think I just realized that probably this is the first time that I I'm, uh, I have the opportunity to talk uh, under such beautiful uh, paintings and in such beautiful room. Normally this doesn't happen at when you go to conferences. <laughs> yes, we feel blessed, I think, all of us. So, uh, <laughs> yes. So we, uh, uh, when uh, I, uh, everything that we did uh, with, my, with my colleagues, we, we did it because we were, the circumstances forced us to do that, uh, do those things. Uh, so uh, we are, we became, I don't know if we are innovating or if we are innovators, but we are, if we are, then it's by accident. Uh, so five years ago, I, I had a pretty comfortable job at a, at a big uh, media company. I was a senior editor and investigative reporter at a, one of the biggest media companies in Hungary. And uh, remember that at the time, uh, we had this Chinese wall between the business side and the editorial side, and we were really proud of being totally ignorant of what's going on on the other side. And, uh, and uh, so now, five years, la five years later, I uh, my, my, uh, run with my colleague, uh, Direct36, which is a small investigative reporting center, a nonprofit based in Budapest, and, uh, and it has become totally natural to, do, to deal with business uh, things and raising money and uh, trying to experiment with new uh, uh, business uh, uh, solutions. And, uh, but as I said, we, it happened because we were forced to do it. I mean, I, I had to leave my job because we came under political pressure at, uh, that, at that company. And then uh, when uh, we left that place with my, with my colleagues and we were thinking of uh, what to do. And uh, we, or personally, I definitely, I realized that I mean, as much as I would like to be one of these big thinkers or visionaries, I, I am not, I'm a reporter. So, but when we, we knew that we had to build our own organization, so what we did that we, we looked around and we looked for uh, uh, other models and other examples. So we, we reached out to uh, organizations who who uh, had some experience with this, uh, reached out to the Global Investigative Journalism Network, which is an umbrella organization for nonprofits like us. Full disclosure, it was a pretty easy thing to do because my wife works for GIGN, so it was not that difficult to uh, get ideas from them. But uh, we also spoke with, uh, with, with colleagues from Germany, Crowd Reporter, the crowdfunding magazine. They, they gave us uh, a lot of help when we were launching the organization Direct36 uh, four or five years ago. And uh, I think the, if we did something well, that was probably that we, yeah, we, we, we listened to others. 
because I think sometimes uh, uh, journalists have you know big egos and not it's very rare I know I know it sounds <laughs> unbelievable but there is and uh, and uh, sometimes they think that they know everything better than others and uh, you know running a business building an organization it sounds so easy if, I, if they can write about complicated things then this should be a, a, a cakewalk and it it is not it's a uh, uh, so I think we it was a it was a good decision to uh, listen to others and 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 uh, and borrow ideas from uh, from other organizations I think if we uh, I read it somewhere that I think Ap Apple's way of innovation is that they don't invent anything new they just uh, uh, buy the ideas uh, from others and then they mix them and then they come up with uh, uh, some new uh, solutions and I think uh, we we did that kind of on a, of course on a, on a much uh, smaller uh, scale so we uh, the, when we created Direct 36, we first of all, well, we made this decision that we wanted to uh, uh, do only investigative reporting, really in-depth, uh, very often data-driven uh, investigations because we simply, well, personally, we were more uh, into that f kind of journalism and more we were more attracted to that. But it was also that because we knew that we thought that there is a, a, a more more need, a higher need for that in uh, in Hungary, and uh, the and we we decided to follow a non-profit model because we thought that that would give us a, a, a bigger freedom and independence in our reporting, because we learned from our experience at the media company that the political pressure is very often. Uh, exercised through financial ways, through contracts, through advertisements. So, and the, we knew that, uh, you know, this organization would be sustainable only if it has a, a, a mixed uh, financial uh, 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 revenue uh, structure. So we, uh, so like, you know, having grants from a few foundations won't be, won't be enough or won't be uh, sustainable so we yes we secured grants at the beginning uh, from some bigger international foundations but we we also created a, a revenue stream for for commercial services so we we started to work for other big media companies uh, in, in Hungary and in abroad uh, and uh, we uh, they, they paid for those uh, services and then we also launched a crowdfunding uh, campaign at the very beginning from the help of crowd reporter and then uh, uh, so we started to build a community around uh, the organization and then that became the focus of our uh, efforts and uh, um, now we have uh, now more than we can cover more than 70 percent of our expenses from from that uh, that revenue revenue stream which means that uh, I mean uh, it was a conscious decision that we we were focusing on on that because we knew that that's the key for our sustainability, and uh, and also the it gives you. It's not only it's, it's no it's a cliche you know it's not only about the money but it's also about the inspiration that you get from your uh, the, the community that is standing standing by you. Uh, so we do uh, we give them uh, you know with our exclusive newsletters only for our supporting uh, supporter members. We do live events. We invite them into our office and then we do workshops uh, uh, with them where we share some of our reporting methods. And uh, you know, I, I really enjoyed these meetings, these these, these conversations. Well, in a nutshell, maybe. I'd Don't worry, we will come back to that, <laughs> especially because, like, I I will also want to talk about what it means to run an organization that's innovative, um, because you know, innovation, yes, it can also translate into how you do tra sort of traditional reporting, but in a new way. Like, mm -hmm. how do you? How do you run an organization like that? And now I actually wanted uh, Natalia to talk a little bit about um, her approach is a little different. Uh, it's also, it's innovative both in the form and in the topics you choose and how you choose them. And you're also not really just focused on where you're based. So what, inno what is innovation to you? 
I have actually, <clears throat> hi, <laughs> sorry. Um, I have actually never asked myself that question, so I only had about, you know, <laughs> very short time to think about it. And, uh, but I have thought about like general themes, and uh, one thing that, um, you know, I, I think is that there is a real sort of tendency in journalism to, uh, f to really look for universal solutions, and I think it's um, a real weakness as an uh, industry. Um, we, um, and innovation sort of has a little bit of a trap of shiny new things, and somehow like every newsroom needs to be innovative, and everyone is, needs to be innovative, and we all need innovation. Uh, the same way suddenly membership is the new solution, you know, and everyone has to have a membership program, um, and everyone's jumping on it. Um, and I think, um, I think what's really important and where innovation does work is when I think most of the time innovation is something that comes out of frustration, um, comes uh, and it's basically a way of adapting to to ever changing reality, and in that way we should always be adapting to the changing reality. Um, in fact, no matter what profession we are in. So um, I don't know. I think this is where the word can also be unhelpful because if we don't think about it like that, then it sets up a trap. Um, with Coda, um, our Whatever innovation uh, it did come from um, it did come from frustration, and it was a frustration, my frustration, and um, that I first voiced, and then I realized that it was shared by many, many other people of the media um, uh, industry, the mainstream media, not being able to provide the kind of the context and continuity to really important issues our tendency to parachute into stories and come out of them and leave long vacuums where we, um, you know, then it's impossible to gain that context, you know, what, um, there's so many examples of that, one of them which is getting old, but, you know, what happened in Libya between the, uh, between the um, invasion and Gaddafi's um, killing and the uh, killing of the U.S. ambassador in Benghazi. It was six months when we basically don't know what went on, even though there were journalists on the ground uh, doing some reporting. Um, and I think, you know, we um, thought that uh, this lack of context did a lot of damage to our understanding of the world and how it works, and that there was a real need for more context and continuity in it. And then coming based on that, we thought, okay, like, you know, how can we build a platform that is built for an, an editorial process that is built for context and continuity. And um, our solution, I still don't know whether it is, I mean, obviously, I think it's the, the best thing ever, but um, I don't know whether it is the solution, but our solution was to build a newsroom that focuses much more on themes than chronology, where, uh, where the when and who and what come after why and how and um, sort of digs deeper and our entire editorial process is, uh, is built around that. So I don't think necessarily the topics that we do, we uh, covered um, authoritarian, we are covering disinformation and uh, we also just launched a new channel covering authoritarian technology. I don't think that uh, looking at how technology is being used by governments to, or by, you know, to promote authoritarian sort of agendas. I don't think the topics are necessarily innovative. These are, these are very big issues that are affecting all of us and media is doing a really good job covering them. Many journalists are doing great stuff. Uh, we're coming to it from the approach of that uh, sort of laser sharp focus, really granular reporting, real focus on showing how these seemingly almost academic themes are affecting people on the ground and are changing real lives of real people. Um, so, um, I, I, and I think for us also where innovation is, um, uh, you know, where, where thinking hard is very important is with the way we tell our stories because um, I think there is a real um, a danger of a lot of worthy journalism being lost because it's not packaged and told well. And, you know, I sit on some... Uh, in, I'm Georgian, uh, and um, you know I sit on a lot of, some juries um, for investigative journalism, and I read a lot of um, I read a lot of uh, well-reported pieces, but I have to read them five times to understand what they are about, and that's not good enough. This is where we lose impact. 
Um, so we have a real focus on, on storytelling and how we present the stories so that we interest, um, you know, we, we get as much interest in them as possible from people who might not care about the topic, but they care about the way we tell the story. Um, and we experiment a lot with that. And that is just an ongoing process. And, you know, I think it's also very um, important to... We try hard to do two things. One, build a, um, build a process that allows for this experimentation and allows for failure and, um, you know, doesn't, doesn't punish failure. And it's a lot easier to do it when you're small and nimble than when you're working in a big newsroom. And the second thing is, like, we try very hard not to be gimmicky. So if you're doing something differently, there has to be a good reason why you're doing it. So I think these are two important things that uh, we pay, um, try to pay a lot of attention to. And, you know, sometimes it doesn't work, and sometimes it does. So, yeah, I don't know how much it answers uh, your question. Um, it does, because I, like, it's one way, I think one could say that all of the things you do are innovative because they are new. Uh, they are new in certain ways. It doesn't, as I said in the beginning, it doesn't have to, it doesn't have to mean that we're doing some funky technology things. We're just, we're just trying to adapt um, to whatever we're facing. And then I, I hope that the, the variety of ways in which we do that can be of inspiration to people. Um, but, you know, it would be very difficult to have a session called very many ways in which, you know, we try to address challenges in many countries. So, so this is why actually the, the, the session is, is a little bit about debunking these terms. So the first one is innovation. We still have uh, Hannah to talk to it. I would like you to talk a little bit about what's happening in Belarus. And then we're gonna be talking a little bit about press freedom and what it means, where, and what it doesn't mean, and how it affects our work, and how it doesn't, and how it's actually, I don't know, maybe necessary, <laughs> a necessary component. Yeah, sure. So I'm gonna break the flow of speaking about, uh, you know, how to run a specific organization um, in your countries. Uh, I'm gonna speak about trends, some exciting trends that are happening uh, in Belarus. But may I ask you first, you know, since Belarus is not really, um, you know, often uh, frequently appearing on the international agenda. May I ask you first, what do you actually, like, how is Belarus perceived in your countries? Um, yeah, the silence is disturbing. So, so, okay, basically, I understand that you obviously know that Belarus is being called as Europe's last dictatorship. That's on one hand. On the other hand, you might have, across, you might have come across recent headlines um, on the New York Times and other media outlets saying that Belarus is a new Eastern European tech hub. Um, and this sounds like two arguing claims. You know, on one hand, we have this dictatorship. On the other hand, we have this you know, innovative center of Eastern Europe. But actually, uh, it makes sense, and it makes sense for uh, in the media field. Um, we have a new growing community of young people who work for international companies who some of them share Western values and they actually earn a little bit more um, than the average person in Belarus and they are willing to donate this money and to fund socially responsible initiatives. And um, three years ago, a young journalist, Katerina Sinyuk, launched a... Um, a startup, a media outlet called Imena, which means the names in English. Um, it's, um, it promotes socially responsible journalism and it basically brings an average person into the agenda of media outlets. So basically the idea, uh, there is a problem, um, there is a powerful um, story about this problem, about the person, I don't know, with disabilities or kids with often, uh, in orphanages uh, who, you know, have bad conditions or women who experience domestic violence. And then there is this button, donate. Um, so basically they create the new, uh, media, a new media approach, um, the fundraising text. And I checked yesterday, they raised up to $900,000, and I'm gonna repeat that again, it's almost $1 million, and we are talking about Belarus, not about, you know, Holland or Scandinavia, or whatever, it's still a, a 
rather poor country. Um, and so why on earth I was talking about um, this young tech professionals? Because I actually asked uh, Katerina uh, last year whether she has information, she has data on who actually donates to this organization. And she said that up to um, around 30, 40% of those who donate money are actually tech professionals. Um, which, which is, you know, which is kind of interesting. Um, for me, it's, um, it's an essence of civil society. And why are they doing this? I believe I have a theory that maybe because in such a repressive country as Belarus is, is actually the only way to participate in social and political decision making. So that's one example. Another example of a successful crowdfunding campaign um, was... Um, um, so the oldest newspaper in Belarus, it's called Nasha Niva, collected um, $8,000. It might not sound that impressive that the previous example, but actually this amount of money were, was, aimed, was aimed to directly support investigative reporting, which is still um, quite rare in Belarus. I have a background in investigative journalism myself, so it's kind of um, the field that, that that is closer to, uh, to myself. Um, and it actually, well, it's still a risky job, not only because you have um, physical uh, threats or you, like, there is a direct threat to your health or life, but also because it's a um, tough country to conduct investigations in. Uh, we have around 50 state institutions that can classify their data as state secrets, which means basically that you can't really ask for, for a comment, you can't file a um, freedom of information request, so you, you can't expect that um, in a country. But there are still some brilliant examples of investigative journalism in my country, uh, which uh, my colleagues did. Um, Basically, some of them um, led to, to the resignations of high-level officials, to the change of legislative norms, so I guess it's a success. However, uh, we are still threatened with um, uh, defamation suites. Uh, it, happens to, it happened to myself a few times, but uh, recently my colleague had a trial process, which he won which is like super, super rare. rare. It's like something, something unique, so you know, this victory um, it's kind of very unique in, um, um, in Belarus. Um, and I'm going to talk about uh, the third trend, which is also um, kind of important. So as everyone um, in the world, you know, from media scholars to big tech giants such as Facebook, um, seems to agree that local media is now endangered. In Belarus, it's actually on the rise. Uh, we have brilliant, brilliant examples of urban magazines, uh, of local media that connect, uh, connects um, city residents to their cities um, in Minsk and other regional cities. But actually, I believe that it's not only you know, about a new cafe that was just opened uh, somewhere, but it's actually a platform where people can meet, share their... Um, you know, values, uh, build a community, um, adopt a shared identity. So it's something more. Um, I think, well, that might be enough for this, for now. Uh, so just to sum up briefly, I talked about um, this crowdfunding campaign, investigations, and local media. Um, that is kind of um, still innov innovative, I guess, and can be perceived as a... So it's sort of innovation in, in, in Belarus. Yeah. Thank you very much. So we're going to move to another, another term that we want to debunk a little bit, another term that can be problematic. Um, and it can be problematic at least in a few ways. Um, wh one of the ways in which it is problematic is that um, the CE region or the SEE region uh, where we come from is usually associated with... Uh, Journalists in our countries just like struggle and fight and uh, keep building civil society which is not there. And I think this is not, not exactly accurate. Um, but I also want to say that press freedom means very many things. And it can mean um, the ownership of media or, you know, it, can, it is obviously under a different threat um, in a regime uh, in Belarus that it is, um, that it is elsewhere. 
but it also means uh, disinformation, hate speech, um, polarization of a political debate and other things that are, uh, that are happening all over the world, not just in this region. Mm. And then the third thing I want to say before I ask you a question actually, is that because it is a part of what we're going through as societies, it obviously, you know, if we are adapting, we're also adapting to it. So it also, it might limit, but it can also inform innovation. You know, we kind of respond to what is happening with what we do. So what is the relationship between your work and the freedom of press? Like I know it's connected on all the different fronts, but also differently in each of the mm -hmm. cases. Right, I'm going to ask someone first, maybe, maybe, maybe Andras, actually, yeah. again. Well, <laughs> I think Andras can take yes. this the best. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, Hungary has been receiving uh, quite a lot of spotlight uh, scrutiny recently, mainly because of the actions of our Prime Minister, Viktor Orban, who has become this household name internationally. Uh, Very and good friend of, uh, <laughs> of uh, Jarosław Kaczyński. Yes, yes, he has he has friends in the in the in the region, and uh, well, but I you know I have to so when I when I go to I come to gatherings conferences and you know very often colleagues from other countries more fortunate or developed countries come up to me and they look at me as if I had a serious disease <laughs> and I you know like asking how you are holding up it must be so bad and uh, you know I have to tell them disappoint them that it's not it's it's bad but it's in a different way than they, they might uh, might think it's a uh, you know, we don't live in fear, and I'm, I'm not getting up every day thinking, well, what terrible things can uh, happen to me. But, uh, of course, the, so it's not, it's not Turkey, it's not Russia yet, uh, it's not, you know, uh, journalists don't get jailed, they don't get, we, I don't think we live in a, a, a physical danger. Uh, obviously, I mean, there were really terrible uh, things happening in Slovakia, in, in Malta, I mean, those were really shocking, uh, to us, us as well, but I very much hope that we are, you know, that in Hungary uh, we don't have to face such uh, threats and dangers. But uh, it's a, it's it's bad in a in a different way, like how the environment is uh, uh, changing, how there are less and less uh, free and independent uh, outlets. It's harder to get your uh, stories out, and what the it's really difficult to deal with is that these these intangible problems that uh, you know we don't you have to realize that even if you don't care about these uh, threats that you know that the maybe the propaganda machine of the government is attacking you and spreading lies about you and uh, maybe you know you get legal threats from the, the, the powerful people but uh, but uh, you, as a journalist, you are kind of used to that. It's, it comes with the job, but you, uh, you have to realize at some point that you are not living in a vacuum. You have family, mem you know, you have families, everybody, uh, and, uh, you know, you have partners. So, like, when uh, about a year ago after the election, parliamentary elections in Hungary, then the, the uh, uh, government-controlled magazine published the uh, uh, list of so-called Soros, George Soros mercenaries, and it was apparently a kind of, uh, you know, attempt to intimidate uh, these uh, organizations and these people who were listed. And then, and then the, the Direct 36 staff was also on that uh, on, on that list. And uh, personally, I was not that surprised. I knew that something like this could could happen. That uh, you know, when you get uh, phone calls from your from your family members and. Uh, from people that you they work with you and they you you feel the 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 concern in their voice like you know because they they uh, worry about you but they also worry about themselves that they think that because they are associated with you you know they they might they might be the next ones so uh, it's uh, that and, and it's really difficult well, how, what, what do you how do you deal with that what are the right answers to, what can what can I t I cannot tell him that uh, these you know people that don't worry you know they will not come after you because they can come it's that uh, it can happen at any any time 
But uh, I also think that, you know, uh, as the, the landscape has changed, the media, media landscape and this government controlled ecosystem, this really powerful machine is, is growing. Uh, it means that uh, now we are the underdogs. And uh, actually, I like the role of the underdog. I, I grew up watching Karate Kid. You know, that's my favorite movie. It's a classic underdog tale story. And then, uh, you know, you can win as an underdog. So that's, that's what gives me some hope, you know. And, uh. Yeah, so like, uh, yeah, it's very important, um, obviously, to have alternative media to the media run by a, a government that's like oppressive. But I think it's also very important to, um, to try to educate people or like to, yes, construct this platform where they can learn how to talk to one another without throwing ideological comments and hate speech everywhere, um, which is maybe what you are doing in some way, Christian. I think one of the uh, difficult things for media everywhere, and this, this, I think this really, I think all of us are fighting various campaigns of disinformation that are pushed to some degree uh, f from governments. And uh, what has been very helpful for people in government, whether they're the um, opposition or whether they're in, in power, is they are very much using technology to fuel division. And I think this is one of the things you are, you are covering, which puts journalists in a very odd position. And I think one of the phenomena we're wrestling with is do we take a side? And if we take a side, how do we speak uh, to our audiences or to people who are not our audience? Uh, and we see that all over Central and Eastern Europe that some independent outlets have become, in a way, co-opted co for better or for worse as the against the, the regime voice. And that also, to my mind, we try to stay away from that a little bit because that's also a way of being co-opted and uh, looking at the world just in one way. So we've tried to, we try to be somewhere in the middle. Um, I'm not saying we are very successful at covering everyone because there are people, there are people who don't talk to us because they say we are too progressive. Uh, they called us, uh, some people called us like you're a gay propaganda magazine because we publish stories about the intimate lives of people in the LGBT community. But then on the other hand, people told us we are a um, uh, bourgeois magazine because we focus on the rise of YouTube stars in, in, in Romania. So to my staff, sometimes that's like, why do we get criticized for just picking the stories? Uh, but I, I, I think that's sort of that center, sort of center path of trying to show how all sides are living in this, uh, I think, in this, in this information war. Because people who are against the LGBT community, they're afraid of something. They're not necessarily afraid of, uh, uh, of the LGBT community, but those are the enemies that, that are being fed to them often on social media. So I want to understand that fear, uh, and that will expose me to criticism from people who say, you can't give a voice to... Yeah. Uh, people that hate in some way. And I think you can. It's, it's a complicated way to do it, but you have to listen to the people who are, you know, afraid that society is changing, and you have to listen to the people that want to push society in a, in, in a more progressive um, direction. So I think in terms of finding, I think uh, we think of freedom also as, as the freedom to uh, piss off our community. Mm. whether by covering a certain topic or by deciding not to cover it in a certain way. Mm. Uh, Romania, I'll just give this one example and then we can move on. R Romania had a referendum to define family uh, in the constitution as being marriage between a man and a woman. Uh, and I think the majority of the independent media outlets in Romania took a side and uh, joined a boycott campaign, saying boycott the referendum, do not go vote, this is, uh, uh, this is against human rights. And although you would have polled our staff and all of us believe that's the way to do it, and I think all of us boycotted the referendum as individuals, we did not take that tack and we did not speak publicly as a media institution um, against the referendum because 
it was already hard enough for us to talk to people who supported the referendum. Mm -hmm. If we would have slapped boycott the referendum on our Facebook page or on our homepage, that would have guaranteed that no one would have opened uh, the door. Uh, so that has allowed us to talk to both sides in, in, uh, in various ways and also sort of, you know, pay the price for that in, in, in some way. But that's, I, I think we need to keep a level head in all the craziness that's going on to some degree. Yeah, I know it's also like, it's also a challenge for us. Like I work on the network activities, but the team of the Outriders magazine is, is there. And uh, you, with all the things happening in Poland, we also kind of, we, we very often try not to take a clear stand because we, we want to be connecting people. Um, and, and you know, you can have like some short term win maybe if you plug into some of these conversations and take a side, but we want to be around for longer and our mission is different, but yeah, it's tricky. Mm. Okay, because like I know that our time is running, so maybe, maybe let's do it this way. I'm just gonna like, um, just say something about the how C doesn't really, you know, mean something and doesn't mean much, but I wanted to ask you what are your, um, uh, what are your struggles connected to running an organization that's based uh, where it's based? And maybe I'm going to start with Natalia because they are not actually really uh, based in Georgia or not only. So um, some of the things we do, you know, could be global, don't have to be global. Some of these innovations work better on a smaller scale. Some of these things are scalable. What can people in the world, you know, learn from us, from you? I don't know, but um, I think related to this question and slightly going back to the previous topic, I don't, you know, um, I think um, I disagree with you that freedom, f uh, freedom of press uh, means different things. I think it means one thing for everyone and that's our ability to do our job. And I think one of the things that hampers the freedom is of press and there are many, you know, from sort of legal tools to the money. Money is a really, really big issue that, and we can't. I recently sat on a some panel about a uh, regional panel about uh, revenue models for the uh, for the uh, Caucasus and Central Asia for independent media. And I was like, what are you talking about? What revenue model can you have as an organization, media organization in Azerbaijan, where like every decent journalist is either in jail or you know dead? Um, uh, so I think you know money is a very big part of it. But I think what um, you were just talking about that kind of self, the you know the, the, uh, journalists very rightly feel that they are under attack because media is under attack, and it's very hard not to. Um, become an activist and take sides and it's very hard to sort of keep listening and try to understand the side that is attacking you as well and um, I think it's really amazing that um, you guys take that stand because I think it's also very rare and I think there are lessons in that for I don't know British media covering Brexit and <laughs> for example um, uh, but um, you know, we are largely, I mean, G Georgia, I think, is now miraculously ranking better in freedom of media than Hungary is, which just shows you <laughs> what a weird world we live in. Um, and uh, we uh, have a team in Georgia, but we're very spread out geographically. We have people in Berlin and London and Moscow in the US. Um, so, and we are covering global um, issues and kind of trying to show how they're interconnected. So. Our troubles are very different from, um, uh, you know, struggles of the local media organizations that, you know, I know a lot about because I'm, I'm there a lot and sort of see it. Um, and uh, um, uh, so, so it would be unfair of me to kind of sort of pretend that we um, face similar risks or um, challenges that uh, some very, very brave newsrooms that are operating under very difficult circumstances. Um, but um, yeah, the uh, I I think you know there are a lot of things that are happening that are also counterintuitive as well, and I think um, uh, because you know going back to that idea that you know a lot of new comes out of frustration, I think we've seen some really interesting stuff that holds lessons for um, others come out of um, you know places where 
uh, there isn't much freedom of media or the freedom of, me of freedom of press is very limited. And it's so interesting that you say that local press is flourishing in Belarus because um, we found that um, in Russia, you know, the regional, while the um, sort of the, the national, on a national level, the media is very controlled and very... Um, that on, on, on a local level, there are a lot of really interesting, very active papers who are doing a lot of social activism, sort of so covering social issues a lot and actually managing to change things on the local level. Um, and I think, so, um, and, you know, there are Russian, uh, in Russia especially, it's a bigger market, so there's more money and, uh, you know, there's more freedom to do stuff. Um, I think there's been some really, really interesting media innovation in places like Medusa doing some really interesting things that um, aren't being done by others. So... I don't think lack of uh, freedom, uh, of l lack of freedom of media is necessarily freedom of press is um, necessarily an obstacle to being innovative. But you know, you, you first have to have your physical safety uh, secured, and then you gotta have some money. And I think the bigger, I think the funders, funders of journalism, um, need to really think harder about how they fund journalism, especially in. Um, sort of th that part of the world because uh, um, and uh, rethink their strategies because I don't think what, whatever is being done now is sustainable. So. Yeah, I think it's also uh, a challenge to actually finance innovation, whatever it means, because, you know, it can fail and, it, like, it might not be scalable, it might work in a given place, but it might not work somewhere else, so... It's actually a, also a challenge to run an organization that deals with, that is trying to adapt because yes, these things change all the time. So you have to be very alerted, but you also have to be ready to fail. So it's obviously tricky to fund these things. But we have heard the perspective of um, someone who runs an organization. I also wanted to ask you, Hannah, how is it to be a freelancer in this part of the world? Um, Natalia mentioned Medusa, um, and that's actually pretty interesting because Medusa is based in Latvia, not in Russia, yeah. and that's actually my case. I'm not based in Belarus. Um, I'm based abroad, and basically, um, Belarus is my you know main country of interest. I do, uh, I keep coming back. I do live there for a longer time, but I just I don't live there. I don't have any assets there, so I just feel that I'm more independent, and. The government doesn't have any tools of influence, you know, uh, they can't, I don't know, prevent me from reporting on, on some critical issues um, and so on. Uh, so working from, from abroad for me means that my work is not censored, nor I don't nor I self-censor my publications. And actually, the issue of self-censorship is very, very important in Belarus, since we are uh, talking about challenges as well, just addressing this issue. Uh, the Belarusian government uses different ways of, uh, you know, how to censure journalists, prevent them from doing their work. Um, how are they doing that? Well, first of all, through um, imprisonment, um, through um, large financial penalties. And th now that's actually, um, this way is becoming more, you know, common. Um, just give you um, a few uh, a few examples. Last year um, alone, journalists were fined 100 times, and a year before, journalists were detained 100 times. So it's still tough, and it's not improving. I just don't believe, you know, these rankings that that say, you know, that the situation is improving in Belarus. It's not. It doesn't. Um, so. Um, however, just uh, just to describe you another like recent, really really exciting trend. Um, so we have this you know very tough situation, but also we have social media that became a kind of safe place for for expression. And there are there is a growing community of digital influencers, you know, brazen politically engaged internet personalities that basically uh, adopt. Journali journalistic practices, and they actually do investigations. There is a case. There is a case of um, of an actor who suddenly became, you know, this YouTuber um, personality, and he reports. He covers local corruption in a regional city in Belarus. Um, and after his coverage, thousands of people, you know, uh, went to, to streets to protest against, um, uh, it was a construction of, of a power plant in the city. 
Um, so there are, you know, many other ex examples. Um, there is open, also open data is becoming more um, widely used among, among bloggers. Uh, there is this guy um, who's a media analyst. He, he's a brilliant blogger, Viktor Malyshevsky, and his blog is called Anti-Journalist because he believes that what he does is not journalism, so he, he's, a, he's an anti-journalist. Um, and he basically, well, he does some data-driven reporting, which is still very unique and still very rare uh, in my country. Um, but also, like, he's trying to kind of um, separate himself from, himself from journalism, and I believe that it's a way for him to kind of uh, to become an alternative and unbiased source of information in a very polarized um, environment, media environment that we have in Belarus. Um, so uh, there is also a very popular Belarusian blogger who created a hashtag, um, what's called Motolko Help. His name is, his surname is Matolko. So basically, he's an urban activist as well, and he saves, um, he managed to save a district in Minsk uh, that was set to demolition. And he got, uh, his, one of his Facebook posts got so widespread coverage that even Lukashenko, even President Lukashenko uh, kind of um, um, made, made, made a hint, he said something about that. So, you know, it's just very, um, it's a, I would, I would call it a new liberating power in Belarus, um, which is also very interesting. If you can, you could observe the same trend in, during the Arab Spring, uh, when, you know, the social media influencers were, were super influential. Uh, but also, I think now you can observe the same trend in, in African countries. So I think it's very symbolic for, for oppressive regimes, um, this kind of alternative, um, um, you know, vo voices, right? Mm. I think, um, well, if we just have six minutes left, I don't know if I should go on. Yeah, I actually wanted to like leave some space for, uh, for, you, for you to ask some questions. Um, yeah, do you have questions to us about anything that we've discussed? Okay, Jakub. <laughs> Hi, I just wanted to ask Hannah, uh, why do you think that local journalism is picking up uh, in Belarus so much? Sorry again? Why do you think that, why do you think the local journalism is picking up? Uh, local journalism, so, well, I mentioned, oh, I think I haven't, I haven't actually mentioned. So there are, um, there are few websites that are becoming very popular now. Um, one of them is called City Dog, you might have heard of it. Um, and there are like many, many other, you know, examples in regional cities as well. So, which is, you know, which is very unique for, um, um, for the, actually for the Belarusian media market, which is still, you know, not very much developed. We have basically two or three models of, you know, how, how media is funded. It's basically state you know, state-owned media or independent media, which is which are funded by foreign governments more often, um, which doesn't mean independence uh, to, to a great extent. extent. Um, and we have this local media, and basically when I analyze how they are funded, it's very interesting. They get more money from advertising than, you know, from, from anything else. And now, you know, we are talking about this decline of, you know, advertising model and so on, but still we have, we have you know, examples of, of media being still funded um, by um, getting money from, from, from ads, which is, which is interesting. Um, Jakob, is that, yeah, okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, there, there is a, yeah, I feel a bit silly asking about this, but I arrived some minutes late and I know every name except the, your, that in the center of the discussion panel, so can you tell me your name and what, for who you write for? <laughs> My name is uh, Christian Lupsha and I'm from Dor in Romania. <laughs> <laughs> Any other, like, clarification? <laughs> okay. Um, I just wanted to ask about Coda story. Um, you were talking about that you have 
um, sort of unique or innovative editorial processes um, as a result of trying to think differently about your journalism. And I was wondering if you can describe a little bit more uh, what you mean and what sort of um, changes you, you've made to the processes to try to be innovative. Sure. Well, we didn't make changes to the processes. We made them up. Um, and some of it was dictated by lack of resources, but <laughs> some of the decisions. But um, basically, the problem we were trying to solve was the, um, uh, was, uh, was the issue. So when we kind of thought, we identified the problem that was making us frustrated, which was the lack, the lack of context and continuity. And then we thought hard about, OK, how do we solve it? And why, why it's there? And one of the things that we realized was because you know, there are obvious answers. There's lack of attention. There is lack of resources in media organizations to follow up and follow through. But one of the things that we realized was also um, the fact that all the, um, all the platforms that we know, most of them you know, in traditional media outlets, were built for as, as disposable. Because traditionally, all media, all journalism platforms were disposable, right? You read a newspaper, you throw it out. Something comes on TV. It never appears again, and so on. And um, so when this was translated into the digital space, it basically created that bottomless pit of updates where and, and increased the workload on the reporters, where reporters would not be able, you know, had to, like, file past there, like, what would be constantly file updates. So that was, so we thought, okay, can we create a platform that isn't, that kind of lays it out more, that isn't that bottomless pit? And uh, some of the answers to that were actually a decision not to do any breaking news at all because we felt others are doing breaking news. We still do sort of news briefs and news updates, but we always try to add value with them instead of just rehashing something that is being said. That meant, of course, also basically not having advertising as an option at all because it limits how much you publish if you're not constantly chasing the news story. And another thing that we did was we thought, okay, so we're going to cover this. Um, if we we're if we're giving thematic um, a priority over chronological, and if we're saying that you know like understanding the theme is more important than understanding sort of just the, knowing the date, um, th that um, you know led us to a decision that whenever we would you know we would pick a topic that we cover, um, say disinformation or you know any any topic and then we look at it and we would try to understand what are the themes that are run through it that you would need to follow in order to understand that bigger issue and then each of us so it's like almost like layers of an onion right like uh, and then each of the stories that we publish lives in one of the themes that are I mean if you go on the website you can see it uh, visually it's easier to sort of understand um, and uh, what it did, which was an unexpected kind of uh, outcome of that editorial decision, it obviously affects how the editorial is commissioned because we're always thinking, okay, where does it, where does it fit? And if it really doesn't fit, maybe it shouldn't, it, it shouldn't be here, you know? So, um, uh, but another outcome of what happened is that we, we realized that uh, that approach creates stories that have an incredibly long shelf life. Um, so we can republish something that we ran a year and a half ago and it will still be sort of valid. And that, and that I think, is quite a valuable um, you know, thing uh, in, in today's world. So this is basically an outline. Um, so we need to go now, but what I want to say at the end, uh, apart from thank you very much for coming and thank you very much for coming, is that journalism is under pressure, but I also think in some way it is an exciting time for journalism and there is a lot of things happening and we've heard about many, many interesting examples. So I hope you leave inspired and enjoy the rest of this day. Thank you. Thank you.